This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. World AIDS Day Worldwide. I'm Shannon Power and we are exploring what's holding us back, the history of HIV, uh, where we've come from. John, how about you? How did you go from, you know, being diagnosed into sort of fighting, fighting for um, HIV or people living with HIV? Well, I was already involved in, in the LGBT rights movement and other social change efforts. So I was inherently political coming into the epidemic. Um, but as Paul said, uh, you know, it wasn't really a decision. It was a matter of, it was much more selfish, actually, in my case. It was really about survival. Uh, and, uh, and it was quickly apparent that the people who became well-informed and who were more engaged uh, were the people who were living longer and, 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 and doing better. Uh, and it was a very natural transition uh, for almost everyone I knew at that time to become activists to one extent or another. Now, we've, we've, we've known about HIV and AIDS for about 30 years now. Sean, can you tell me a little bit about what it was like at the time finding out you were HIV positive? Well, I, I didn't find out for sure I was HIV positive until the test came out in 1985. But from the very first articles that were published in 1981 that identified symptoms that some of the people who died had shared, I knew that whatever this was had something to do with me. And uh, I think in those first couple of years, it was mostly about fear and uncertainty. Uh, and then as the epidemic became more widely known, then it really became about the stigma and people being afraid to touch you, people um, um, you know, not wanting to be in your presence even. Uh, and, and even worse than that, the, you know, I was very engaged in efforts to stop the, the uh, ballot referendum in California to quarantine people with HIV. And I find that so many people today don't understand that history in the first years and don't understand how close we came to being quarantined uh, and other similarly very repressive measures. So it was a struggle, very conscious struggle for, uh, for survival uh, in a uh, in an environment of tremendous uncertainty, fear, and of course, uh, a loss. Now, Paul, I mean, that, that idea of potentially quarantining people, I'm sure you're probably getting the reports of that here in Australia. I mean, that is terrifying, as, as Sean said. How did that make you feel as, you know, someone in the community and, and living with HIV? It was, it was very bad. One of the reasons that I didn't get uh, diagnosed earlier was I, when the uh, test came out in 85 or 86, I went to see my doctor and I said, you know, I think I should have this, this test. And he, he advised me against it and he talked me out of it. And the reason he talked me out of it was because he said, you know, I can't guarantee that they won't come and knock on the door and collect you in the in the night, you know, I, that because that's where the political discussion was at the time. You know, Fred Nile in Sydney was was calling for for you know gays to be rounded up and and uh, and locked away for the good of the community. So you know, he said, don't have the ha don't have the test because you know there's no treatment anyway. There's nothing w it will tell you that you you know that will change your 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 life. And I just can't guarantee the security of your you know, confidential information that, you know, that you won't, as a consequence of that, be quarantined. That's quite frightening. And so how did you, I mean, you didn't have the test till the early 90s. How do you live your life thinking that potentially you might be living with HIV? Do you, did you take certain precautions, therefore, in your, in, your, in your sexual life? Or how do you live with that for a few years not knowing? Uh, well, I think we were all um, practicing safe sex at the time, so I felt pretty confident that if I had it, that I wasn't going to pass it on. Um, but, you know, in answer to sort of the question of how I kind of, you know, processed that in my head at the time, I'm not really sure what the answer is. You know, denial, to live in, uh, denial is a, a, a river in uh, Africa, as they say. Um, uh, certainly when I did have the test, I expected it to be positive and it was positive and my doctor said, you know, this isn't a surprise, is it? And I said, you know, that, I, that it wasn't. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Sean, we know that even today, 30 years on, and there's you know, adv been advances in treatment, um, advances in even in education, but stigma is still really a huge issue for people living with HIV. Um, why do you think that that stigma remains? Well, I actually think the stigma is worse today than it was then, and which people often find surprising because most people... Uh, 
think of stigma in terms of their own personal fear of casual contagion. And they know that while they once might have been afraid of, you know, catching HIV from a toilet seat or from sharing a drinking glass or something like that, they know better than that now. So they therefore think the stigma is somehow less, uh, even though in the U.S., about a quarter of the people in the country think you can get HIV from a drinking glass, and I think it's a 12% from a toilet seat. Uh, and as awful as those numbers are, they're not as bad as they used to be. But that is a measure of fear of casual contagion. The stigma is as much about prejudgment, uh, about othering, about marginalization, as it is anything else. And in those measures, uh, it is worse today. Uh, a young gay man, for example, testing positive uh, 25 years ago, uh, came out into a, a community, a, a broader LGBT community that accepted the epidemic as a collective responsibility and wrapped their arms around this person with love and said, we will get through this together one way or another. Uh, that embrace, that collective community concern and commitment is mm -hmm. absent today. Mm -hmm. uh, a young gay man testing positive uh, today is much more likely to be subjected to messages uh, uh, shaming him. Uh, his social uh, uh, environment is going to be more disrupted uh, than it would have been years ago. So the, the, specifically your question why, I think there are a variety of reasons. I think uh, one is uh, the changing uh, nature of who gets HIV. You know, when the face of AIDS in the U.S. was middle class uh, white gay men, uh, you know, mom's hairdresser or the florist down the street or those two nice boys on the corner, uh, uh, the country responded in one way. Uh, as the epidemic increasingly settled into communities of color and communities of poverty and people who use drugs, uh, it be became easier for the country to look the other way. Uh, the media has left the epidemic. The celebrities have left the epidemic. The gay community has left the epidemic. And the people still struggling uh, to fight it, uh, AIDS has to sort of get in line with a hierarchy of challenges uh, that are all intertwined, uh, that involve uh, uh, racism and homophobia and sexism and mental health issues and addiction issues and homelessness and being underhoused, uh, uh, domestic violence, a whole range of issues that are uh, that are intertwined. It can't be addressed in a singular fashion uh, uh, the way uh, many uh, 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 dealt with it in the past. Absolutely. Now, so you say that in, you know, in your opinion, Sean, it's worse now. And I, I guess there's also a, an issue that maybe a lot of people don't know about is that that internalized stigma, that own sense of, of self-shame. For anybody who might be listening now that is living with HIV or know someone that is, what sort of advice would you have for them, Paul, about, you know, coming to terms with living with HIV or what, what, what advice would you have for someone feeling internalised stigma? Yeah, I think that's a really important point, uh, Shannon. The, uh, the, that's one of the things about stigma. As Sean says, it's not just about what other people think of you. It's what you think of yourself. And it works in, in very insi insidious ways. And uh, Living Positive Victoria, we certainly uh, 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 support people who are, uh, dealing with a diagnosis and uh, for everyone that's different it's always difficult um, even for, for some people who who say well you know this was an inevitable thing for me I kind of knew that this would happen one day you know those people have have their own issues with stigma that that, that maybe were presenting before they uh, even became uh, HIV positive so it's um, you know it's important for people to understand uh, the, that HIV is a virus it's not a statement about your 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 personal mor morals or your behaviour or your worth as a person uh, and uh, it's something that, uh, you know, it's a simple biomedical process that we're all uh, having to deal with. Uh, um, but, you know, that, it's easy to say that. It takes a lot more kind of time and, and work for people people to deal with that and uh, I'm sure I speak for all, all positive people when I say we're all, all always kind of still coming to terms with our diagnosis and what it means for us. And how do you personally, did you ever feel yourself personally, uh, Paul, a sense of internalised stigma or self-shame? And how did you deal with that? Um, yeah, certainly. Uh, I think uh, w certainly when I was diagnosed, I felt uh, that I you know, wouldn't be able to tell anybody that I was HIV positive. I had a lot of trouble telling my boyfriend at the time who, thank God, left me. Um, <laughs> 
the the uh, uh, you know and, and it was a very slow process initially you know for me to kind of you know tell tell uh, some trusted friends and some trusted members of my family um, but for me ultimately that process of coming out was very reparative and it was very therapeutic and uh, you know I eventually put my my foot on the on the accelerator and uh, and you know came out very publicly as HIV positive uh, with a, w you know with a website in the early 90s and uh, through other other processes so I and and that's been part of my kind of I think my coping strategy is to be very public and to speak out uh, about being HIV positive and, and you know I, th I feel like that helps other people uh, but it certainly helps me as well so it's twofold it is it's, it's win -win. a win-win yep, yeah absolutely now, Sean, you've been uh, living with HIV for more than 30 years. Um, can you, because we are talking about the history of HIV, can you give us a bit of an idea of how your treatment over time has changed sort of from the beginning until now? Uh, sure. Um, I think in the beginning, well, uh, in some ways it's changed, in some ways it hasn't. Uh, the, the, I have become increasingly self-reliant. Uh, and I think, you know, I always say that becoming informed is a more important step in one's treatment than any uh, uh, pill or potion. Uh, and my experience uh, is, is really driven by skepticism. You know, there are so many things at various stages in the epidemic where there is a conventional wisdom, where in the, you know, the, 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 the best conclusions of science or clinicians uh, uh, that later, sometimes just a few months later, sometimes years later, turned out not to have been the smartest thing. So it's a very difficult thing to find that balance between finding professional experts you can trust and learn from, and also learning to understand something in yourself and, and to listen to your body and instinctively um, um, have a sense of what makes uh, sense for a person. I actually today take less antiretroviral medication than anyone I know with HIV uh, who is taking antiretroviral medication. Uh, I take a combination that isn't approved by anyone except me, uh, and I got there through years of, of, of experimentation. Uh, so I think that the, but the most important thing is becoming well-informed and maintaining a degree of skepticism and understanding that people with every best intention, and even sometimes with a long uh, string of impressive degrees, uh, can give you advice that uh, is not uh, uh, is not in your best interest. Is that though coming from thirty years of experience? You can feel confident with saying that. I imagine somebody that is you know newly diagnosed might not have that confidence to be able to stand up for themselves and suggest, or even perhaps have the knowledge to know what is best for them. How would you uh, give advice to somebody newly diagnosed in terms of finding the best treatment for them? I think starting with, with understanding the history and reading a lot, I still think Michael Callan's book, Surviving AIDS, that was published in 1990, is, uh, uh, is very important and useful for anybody newly diagnosed. At the time he published it, there were people criticized him for even suggesting survival was possible, that they called it a cruel hope. Um, but in that book, he found three characteristics uh, shared by the, a number of people he interviewed who were living with HIV, with AIDS at the time. The first was that they could identify a reason uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to get up in the morning. Uh, they, they had something they wanted to live for that they could define. When asked, they could define. They wanted to see their daughter graduate from high school or they wanted to you know, make it to the concert in a month from now or whatever it was. The second was, um, uh, 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 the second was that when asked um, what they did to treat their virus, uh, their illness, they had a long list of things. Uh, they were seekers. It wasn't so much what was on the list, but it was a matter of, of trying all sorts of different things, including many complementary and alternative therapies. They were the ones out there looking for what would work for them. Um, and um, uh, I lost my train of thought. Uh, <laughs> I I have to agree, agree that that book. Exactly the first two that, we followed. The first, the first was they believed survival was possible, which was very important at the time because there was almost no one telling people that survival was possible. The media, uh, whenever it referenced uh, the epidemic, it was bracketed inevitably fatal, dread disease, terminal illness, no survivors, no treatment. The possibility of survival had been taken away from people with HIV. 
And so those who were living uh, first, they believed that it was possible. And sorry to interrupt you, Paul. No, that's all right. <laughs> I was interrupting you. Uh, I, I just want to agree that's a fantastic book. I love Michael Callan's that book, Surviving AIDS, and people should read it. It's, it's dated medically now, but it's such an uh, inspiring kind of uh, a read about, uh, you know, his determination to survive. And I love the fact that he came up, uh, he decided the cure for AIDS was, uh, was love, classic Coke, and the love of a good man. Oh, luck, classic Coke, and the lo love of a good man was all, was all you need. And uh, I, I uh, remember reading that back in the day, and that was, that was fantastic. I think it is a lot easier today for people because the treatments are a lot simpler, and you can kind of go to the doctor and, you know, get the prescription and take the pills. And, and, and you know, in most cases, that for, for m most people, uh, that works out pretty well. Uh, you know, back in our day, you had to be kind of a, a doctor, a, a, a kind of a barefoot doctor, and, you know, research you know what treatments were available and what which ones would work and and you would have these lengthy late night discussions with people about strange things like bitter mel melon enemas and ozone treatments and all sorts of strange uh, f things that that p that people latched onto at the time so it's fantastic that we have really reliable medical treatments available today for people because I imagine as well you know being diagnosed even in the early 90s when we're still sort of learning a lot about HIV that the, the evolution of treatment and, and the medications must have been a tricky time to be living in because, you know, there's all this new information coming out. And then, as, as Sean said, sometimes they change their mind about what works and what doesn't. Paul, can you tell me what it's like? I mean, you sort of gave us a bit of an idea of you considering even ozone treatment and, and what have you. But how do you cope over, over time with potentially a, a new treatment that's come out that your doctor recommends that maybe in a couple of years is not is not right or, or won't work for you anymore or they've all doctors have changed their minds i mean that must be sort of living on tenterhooks for such a long time yeah uh, look I, I don't think that's the case anymore i think for people who are starting treatment uh today or in the last last few years the quality of the of the medications and and the the degree of sophistication that's involved in designing and developing and testing those drugs is far far and away it's light years ahead of of what we had 10 or 20 years ago so um i don't think that people should think that if they're starting today's treatment that they'll be out of date uh, within a couple of years. I think uh, the treatments we have now have tremendous longevity and uh, it, uh, it's likely that if people find a treatment that works for them, they'll be able to stay on that for a long, long period of time. The thing that's probably going to come along that's going to change that is a cure, you know, or, you know, a, a, a tremendous, you know, quantum leap advance in treatment. Uh, and, you know, the sooner the better, I'm, I'm sure we all agree about that. But I don't think that that we have the situation that we had in the 1990s where, you know, you would start taking today's hot new drug and two years from now you'd be reading in the paper that, you know, it's ca it causes terrible kind of long-term side effects. I just don't think that that's happening today. Which is great news, I imagine. Oh, it's, it's fantastic. Yes. It's fantastic. We're on Joy 94.9, a special 24-hour broadcast, World AIDS Day Worldwide. I'm joined in the studio by Paul Kidd, an activist, and uh, on the phone, we've got Sean Straub, who's in New York, who's the executive director of Zero Project. Now, I wanted to um, speak to you guys. Before we do that, I'd also like to encourage everyone to, uh, if you want to get involved in the conversation, you can email us on air at joy.org.au or join in the conversation on Twitter. And the hashtag is joywad. Uh, you've got two experts in the field here who um, you can throw questions at. And I'm sure they, they'd love them. Um, you both, you both um, work a lot in criminalisation. Um, Paul, can you, and you know, you're also a legal activist as well. Can you give us a bit of an idea of what work you're doing at the moment? Yes. Yeah, so, so this is an issue with uh, that, that's uh, uh, prevalent in here in Victoria and also ar around Australia and around around the world. That that people with HIV occasionally uh, face criminal proceedings because they've transmitted uh, the virus to somebody, or uh, be or because they ha uh, have not transmitted the virus to somebody, but they're accused of having placed them in danger. Um, we've had a relatively small number of prosecutions in Australia, but um, but uh, obviously that's uh, for the people involved, they're, they're uh, not trivial. So we've had about 30, uh, 36 prosecutions in Australia. But the majority of those, 19 of those prosecutions, have been here in Victoria. Uh, so Victoria has the uh, unenviable record as of being the leading state for criminalisation of HIV. We have the only, uh, the only HIV-specific criminal law on the books in Australia is here in Victoria, Section 19A of the Crimes Act. 
uh, and it's an area that we're trying to to uh, combat. We don't think that it's appropriate th to use the criminal law to try and control people's sexual behaviour. Um, uh, that uh, consenting adults in in private, uh, uh, if there's a HIV issue that arises there, the appropriate way to deal with that is through education and through a, um, public health response rather than uh, through trying to, to coerce people and trying to control their behaviour through the criminal law, which we know just doesn't work. Yeah, absolutely. And Sean is also the executive director of the Zero Project, a network of people with HIV in the US fighting for freedom from stigma and injustice. And I want to talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Um, they're joining us. Um, they'll be back in a moment. We do want your questions. Email on air at joy.org.au. And we're we'll back with your comments and questions after these messages. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. I'm Shannon Power and we are exploring what's holding us back, the history of HIV, uh, where we've come from. i have joined in the studio by Paul Kidd and on the line I've got Sean Strubb in New York, the Executive Director of the Ciro Project. Now I've got a question to Sean. As a writer and director, how do you think the depiction of HIV positive people changed in mainstream media um, as movies and plays have portrayed it a bit more? Uh, you know, Paul made a very important point about how much more effective treatment is today and, and more tolerable. And in fact, someone who tests positive today who has access to treatment has every reason to expect to live a normal lifespan. That success has also had an impact on the stigma. Because up until the introduction of effective treatment in the mid-90s, people with HIV, regardless of what someone thought about the morality or the homosexuality or whatever else, uh, there was some measure of compassion because it was expected that we were going to die horrific, awful deaths. Uh, then, when combination therapy came out and we began to live and survive, and, and as that began to be more broadly understood by society and by media, we started to be seen differently uh, rather than that compassion uh, uh, and uh, concern in that regard. People with HIV started to become increasingly defined by the, in the US at least, by the public health system and the criminal justice system through the prism uh, and, and the media, through the prism of our potential to infect as individuals who are inherently dangerous to society. Because we are around longer, we are around longer and can infect longer. We are defined as viral vectors. And this is what uh, I think has significantly contributed to uh, the, uh, the criminalization phenomenon with the media, uh, um, you know, flashing pictures of somebody and AIDS monster and AIDS predator and, uh, and, you know, requiring people with HIV to be able to prove that they disclose their status to a partner before being intimate, regardless of whether there was any risk, uh, regardless of whether, uh, 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 there was any HIV transmission those criminalization cases in the U.S. only rarely, certainly less than 5% of the cases ever even involve HIV transmission. Uh, most of them don't involve any measurable or significant risk. Very often the person has an undetectable viral load and, a, and uses a condom. But they're still paraded around the media uh, as horrific monsters and, and predators. So I think that is a, a very dramatic sea change that, uh, in how people with HIV are viewed and how that drives stigma and makes it more difficult. Uh, uh, to get people most at risk tested and accessing uh, care and treatment. Absolutely. Now, Absolutely. as Executive Director of the Ciro Project, can you tell us a little bit about the work that you do? Sure. The Ciro Project, first and foremost, is a network of people with HIV uh, who have uh, organized together to uh, combat stigma uh, generally and criminalization in particular. Uh, we include a network of survivors of criminalization prosecutions, uh, several of whom are featured in the, the short film HIV is not a, a crime on our, on our website. Uh, and I write about this at some length in, in body counts in, in, in my book. Um, and, and so our first effort was just to sort of educate the community to this phenomenon um, because very often, because even people who work in the epidemic didn't understand this issue, you know, and they, they, they think of the criminalization as you know, some, you know, a terrible sociopathic person uh, out there, you know, infecting one person right and left. And that's not what it's about. You know, and there certainly are 
you know, people who have various problems and mental illnesses and so on and, and uh, may pose a risk to others. But the vast majority of these cases are situations where uh, there is not a significant risk. Uh, and yet we're responding to it by creating a viral underclass in the law. And that is our ultimate objective in the U.S. is to get these laws in about two-thirds of the states overturned, these HIV-specific laws that only apply to people with HIV. When most people think it's not a very good idea to create different criminal law for different parts of society based on the color of one's skin or their gender or sexual orientation or physical ability or disability or genetic makeup, uh, here we're doing it around a virus. And yet there are other sexually transmitted viruses which, if left untreated, can seriously harm or kill someone. You know, more women in the U.S. died last year of cervical cancer that they got from HPV, human papillomavirus, than died of AIDS. Yet we don't have states creating HPV-specific laws because that sexually transmitted infection isn't specifically associated with an outlaw sexuality or with people of color, or with anal intercourse, or people who use drugs. So this is what CERO is fighting uh, by mobilizing and educating uh, people with HIV to speak up for themselves and to become active in uh, the policy discussion uh, uh, and, 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 and policy making that uh, is having such a huge effect on our lives and our society. Absolutely. And are there any, you know, it's sort of similar work that, that both of you are doing. Are there any sort of positive outcomes that you can foresee in the future? Like, are you speaking to lawmakers at the moment, Paul? Can you see things changing in terms of the law? Look, it's a, it's a slow process. Um, we're, we're confident that in the longer term we, we will get Section 19A removed from the Crimes Act uh, here in Victoria. I think it's an embarrassment for this state to have the only HIV-specific law in uh, criminal law in the country uh, still on the books here. It was enacted in uh, 1993, so, so uh, 20 years ago, by the uh, by, the then uh, Liberal government, uh, you know, it's ostensibly as a measure that would uh, criminalise the use of uh, of blood filled syringes in violent crimes, it's never been used for that purpose. The only uh, prosecutions that have been brought brought on it are uh, related to sexual transmission. The only conviction that has ever been uh, had uh, on it was a, a, a for three counts of attempt, uh, and that was the Michael Neal case in two thousand eight. Um, so it's never been effectively used. It sits there, it's, it sticks out like a, a sore thumb as the only uh, HIV-specific criminal law, and I think that the, uh, the government of Victoria should be embarrassed by it, uh, and you know, we think that we'll be able to get that removed in the long term. So for people who missed, might have missed it a bit earlier about what the, the, that section of law is, is it, it's, can you please explain it for us? Yeah, so look, if, if I uh, come up to you in the street with a syringe full of HIV-infected blood and I stick it into you and you become HIV positive, then I can be convicted of intentional transmission of HIV under Section 19A of the Crimes Act. And that carries a penalty of 25 years uh, imprisonment. So it's a very serious violent crime. It's classified as an extremely uh, serious crime violent crime in terms of sentencing. Um, if I come up to you with a machete and hack your arm off, then that's a less violent crime. Okay, and and uh, as I say, Section 19A has only been used for sexual transmission, so it's considered to be a more serious offence under Victorian law for someone to intentionally transmit HIV during an intimate, consenting sexual act than it is to come up and commit an act of horrendous uh, uh, non-fatal violence on you. So uh, it's 20 years for for um, the uh, uh, for regular. Uh, uh, kind of violence and 25 years if if HIV is, is involved and I think that that exceptionalizes HIV in a in a really unfortunate and and inappropriate way. Absolutely. Now, does that apply? Does that law just apply to HIV or any sexually transmitted? Infection? So the the law is termed it, it's it's uh, it's called intentionally transmit a very serious de disease and the definition of a very serious disease is HIV. So it only applies to HIV. So I do the exact same thing with hepatitis C. Uh, then uh, I can uh, not be convicted under Section 19A. And that's quite scary. And does ignorance of the law count? So, for example, if you don't know that you're HIV positive, does that law still apply? This is one of the problems with using the criminal law to control people's behaviour. It gives you an incentive not to know your status because you can't be convicted 
uh, under the criminal law if you don't know that you're HIV positive. Uh, so that's one of the real problems around the world with increasing criminalisation of HIV is that it actually is counterproductive to the end that it seeks to achieve. Uh, it doesn't reduce transmission of HIV because it gives people an incentive just not to know and not to find out. And we know overwhelmingly that almost everyone who become, uh, who's diagnosed with HIV positive changes their behaviour. They take steps to protect themselves, they take steps to protect their partners and they step uh, and uh, and you, you know it's the beginning of the end of that kind of you know a part of the HIV transmission story. So it, it, they, it, you know criminal laws are just a terrible idea in terms of of controlling public health. Um, we are on Joy ninety four point nine. It is the World AIDS Day worldwide uh, broadcast, which you can watch online as well. And the website is worldaidsdayworldwide dot org. I've got Paul from Central Victoria in the studio with me. On the line, we have Sean Strub, who is in New York. It is a truly international broadcast. We have Matthew Waite, who is listening in Hong Kong, and he wants a shout out. So, hello, Matthew. Thank you for Hi, listening. Matthew. Um, now, <laughs> it's a truly international hello there. Do we know much about HIV in Hong Kong and, and laws? And I guess they fall under the jurisdiction of, of China now, don't they? Or do they have their own separate court of law? I can't answer that do one. We, do you know much about HIV in Hong Kong, Sean? To put you on the spot? Uh, <laughs> Yes, no, I, I am actually uh, very uh, poorly informed about HIV in Hong Kong. Yes, it'd be it'd be very interesting because uh, it, it, you might have heard in the in the previous hour in the first hour with uh, Dean Beck hosting that the approach and the treatment for HIV in each country, even w countries as similar as Australia and the United States and England, the approach to treatment and anti stigma and all of that is is quite different. Do you find that um, your work can be cross cultural, or do you find that if you do ever travel or you know conduct an interview in Australia that your the the approaches do need to be different? Sean? Oh, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, I wasn't sure who you're asking. Um, I mean, I think that the criminalization phenomenon and stigma uh, manifests differently in different different contexts, but there is also a commonality to it that uh, that I think goes across the board. But as Paul, you know, said, he expressed optimism about uh, changing the statute there. I share that optimism, but I think what is doing it. Uh, what what is actually you know motivating uh, um, many people to pay attention to these issues is not the injustice it imposes on people with HIV, as horrific as that is. People in the U.S. being put in prison for decades for spitting or something. Um, uh, but the, the what horrific public health policy these statutes and prosecutions uh, represent. Uh, as Paul noted, these you know. Uh, statutes were originally passed with the idea they would slow transmission of the epidemic and the body of evidence is growing uh, indicating that they're actually doing the reverse uh, that in some communities particularly some of the communities uh, at greatest risk of HIV uh, you hear take the test and risk arrest um, because they are concerned about being infected with the legal knowledge with the knowledge of their HIV status and because we now um, uh, punish the responsible behavior that is knowing your HIV status, and we privilege uh, the ignorance of one's HIV mm -hmm. status, yet we know that once people know their HIV status, they are far less likely to transmit HIV than those who have HIV and don't know it. Uh, so I think the effect of the criminal law uh, is something that is very similar from one uh, country uh, to the next in terms of how it discourages people from getting tested and accessing care. Which then I imagine just contributes to this vicious vicious cycle. If you, if you don't know your status, then you know, you're know we're at greater risk of, of transmitting HIV, which is quite scary. Um, now, looking at the history of HIV, I imagine as well the, the history between different cultures and different countries, the progression and history of HIV is, is quite different. Can you talk on that at all, Paul? Uh, the differences in experiences for different countries over the past 30 years? Yeah, I, th I think, um, uh, you know, it, it's true to say that HIV is not one global epidemic. It's a, it's a, it's a myriad of, uh, of different minor local epidemics, each of which has its own characteristics and its own, own story. I mean, certainly in Australia, uh, 
our our epidemic uh, has uh, mirrored the United States epidemic in a, in a lot of ways. Um, uh, it was uh, initially only in in gay men. Uh, uh, it remains um, in Australia primarily a disease of, of gay men, which is, is certainly changing in other parts of, of the developed world. In the United States, it's less and less a disease of, of gay men. It's more a disease of, of, of people of colour. Um, uh, so, I, uh, yeah, I, as I say, I think it's a different story in different places. Obviously, the story in Africa is... Com- it, it's a completely different story to the one that we have here in Australia. And yet we're united, with, you know, that we are challenge, challenged by the same... Uh, disease by the same virus, uh, it, it behaves in the same way. It doesn't discriminate against people. Uh, so uh, y- yeah, there's that, that different story in different places, but but the same kind of challenges and the same kind of, of uh, needs for response. Now we can talk about you know specific milestones in the history of HIV, um, which might be a bit dry. You know, talking about developments in medication and and what have you. I'd like to know more about both of your personal histories. Now, Paul, you relate to living with HIV um, as living with a girlfriend called Iris the Virus. Iris, I love her. <laughs> I love her and I hate her. But it, like, like a typical girlfriend, love-hate relationship, I imagine. From from day one, um, when even before you, you were tested and you thought you might be living with HIV, how has your relationship with HIV changed? Um, uh, Obviously, the kind of the prognosis has changed. When I was uh, when I was diagnosed, I asked my doctor how long I could expect to live, and he said three or five years. But then he kind of had a little note of optimism at the end, and he said, "You know, things might get better. You know, you could live for another ten years. You don't know." That was twenty years ago, so I feel pretty pretty happy with the way that things have have turned out. Um, uh, and and inevitably, you're kind of psychic kind of relationship with with the disease changes because it, it goes from being kind of preparing for the inevitable to thinking about how to live in the long term and how to how to be part of the solution uh, and how to how to uh, respond to HIV uh, and how to you know grow into an old man which I have to say is quite a challenge for someone who spent most of their life you know expecting to die as a young man um, uh, you know in some ways that's that's one of the hardest hardest aspects of it You've got a house out in the country now and a couple of dogs. That's a, that's a good start, I think, Paul, <laughs> preparing to be an old man. Sean, how about yourself? How, in your personal history, how is your feelings towards living with HIV and your relationship with, with HIV changed? You know, I think that initially, my when I tested positive, I was expecting that I would test positive. And I, I kind of sought a detente to seek an equilibrium with the virus, just not aggravate it. It's here. I wasn't going to get rid of it, uh, just to, to not aggravate it. But the effect of living with it and then, you know, becoming ill and so on, uh, like Paul, my doctor gave me a prognosis, and, I, and he was a friend, and he had tears in his eyes, and his hands were across the desk holding my hands. And he said, look, Sean, these days you can have a good two years left. And... Um, uh, so I found that my planning window for my life began to shorten. Even after I had passed that two-year period, as I began to get sicker, there was a point when, you know, the annual dental checkup, I didn't go to it. I didn't expect to be alive the next year, so, you know, why waste the time? I stopped buying new clothes. Uh, and then when combination therapy came out and I started to get better, the planning window for my life began to expand because at first... You know, it wasn't just a switch flipping and suddenly everything was wonderful. You know, we had had drugs that had worked for a while before. So there was a, a you know, the skepticism I was talking about was in, was in play. And But at, as time passed and I continued to get better, uh, I started looking further and further into the future where one day I realized that I wasn't expecting that I would die of AIDS any longer. I will probably die of, uh, you know, something else related to aging and and the treatments and things like that, that, that that planning window is indistinguishable now from the planning window for my life in general. Was there a particular point, and I, I imagine it's hard to pinpoint, but was there a particular moment in your life living with HIV, Sean, where you were like, right, I am I will turn into an old man and I will lead a sort of relatively normal, healthy life? Or was it just something that sort of happened over a few years? 
you know, it happened gradually. I mean, it, it happened to, you know, when I realized I started thinking a year or two years out or, you know, I'm going to probably be around to see my nieces graduate from high school or, you know, started thinking, engaging in projects that wouldn't come to fruition for four or five years that, you know, something was just, I couldn't even have conceived of it a few years before. And suddenly, uh, not suddenly, I mean, just eventually I realized that, that, uh, that expectation that my life was going to be shortened by the virus had gone away. So it wasn't uh, it, one particular light bulb moment? No, it, 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 it happened gradually. That must be a very thrilling and exciting moment to, to realise that you will see your nieces graduate or what, whatever that particular milestone is that you're looking forward to. Uh, it must be a fantastic feeling. It is a pretty wonderful feeling. I mean, it's a peculiar feeling because, you know, you're accompanied by all these memories of, you know, all the people who are your friends in your 20s and your 30s that, you know, expected to grow old with and, uh, and they're no longer there. And, uh, but they, they don't go away. You know, they're still with you and you, and you find yourself, you know, I'm 55 years old and um, uh, I don't have a lot of friends of my own immediate generation <laughs> except people. I've sort of met through the activism and advocacy and this sort of you know, network that way Fantastic. because so many of them are gone. All right. Thank you so much. Sean Straub is, uh, I've been chatting to us from Zero Project. Paul Kidd's also in the studio. This conversation, what's holding us back, history and where we've come from, is continuing next July when AIDS 2014 comes to Melbourne. In the next hour with Michael Dalton, we're talking about no one left behind people who use drugs. Uh, thank you to Paul and Sean for joining us. I'm Shannon Powell and I'll be back at 7pm to d discuss uh, stigma. Bye for now. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Shannon. Bye.